Renee with Whitey. Yes, the first time for 2021 uh, for us to re-kick our series with Q&A. And uh, so glad you could join us. And we've got hundreds and hundreds of brokers from around the country with us this morning. And uh, that's really, really great to see. Thank you so much for being with us. We've got a great lineup of folk joining us to have a chat this morning. Uh, we'll come back to that shortly. But um, as usual, I hope you haven't forgotten the rules. Got your coffee? Got to have your coffee. Got to sit back and relax. And of course, you got something to eat, a bit of morning tea. Uh, my morning tea's changed, not like the image there that shows me the croissant. Uh, some nuts. I, uh, I promised myself last year I'd do a lot more work on my uh, type 2 diabetes. Didn't work out so well. And uh, about just on six weeks ago, they gave me a bit of a shunt. And uh, since then, on a new program, dropped 6.1 kilos and uh, dropped my daily insulin level. So I've got to stick a needle in my gut every night from uh, 36 units to six. And I'm hoping I'll be off the insulin in about a month's time. So um, that's very cool. The one thing I didn't do though, I had planned to teach myself the piano in, uh, in memory of my late mum, who was a fantastic pianist. And I uh, haven't done that yet. So I need to get cracking on that one. And because mum passed away in the heat of COVID, we've all had our um, challenges through COVID personally. I've had met, spoken to and, and had many uh, brokers message me about the challenge they were having personally and with uh, depression and anxieties and so on and my heart still goes out to all of those and uh, trusting everybody's getting through it and uh, yeah I was, I was no different uh, as I said mum passed away about a month from now so it would have been late April early May in the heat of COVID did the 10 funeral 10 people funeral thing and uh, and uh, then spent uh, two weeks in quarantine when I got back but she made it to 95 so yeah I only wish I make it that long and of course I went through some cancer surgery uh, around that uh, August of last year. And uh, I found out yesterday I'm up for a bit more in the uh, beginning of May. So we all have our difficulties, but that can't stop us. And I'm so great, I'm so pleased to see how great our industry dealt with things through the COVID period. Um, and with most people saying they've never been busier, numbers are up, business is going well for the vast majority of people. And uh, we just hope everybody keeps focused on going forward and a part of that focus we're going to talk about today and uh, before I go oh I've got a new helper Iron Man I'm a big Iron Man fan he now looks after my phone good on him I can sit there in case Mariah needs to message me um, but one thing I do want to remind everybody that's on my phone is we have recently sent out uh, a survey to everybody to complete for brokers and for brokers customers it's a research piece we're doing to speak back to government around clawbacks and also the 2022 remuneration review. I need you all to do it. It's important that we get as many people doing it as we can. And at this stage, I think we're sitting around about a thousand people have, but um, there's far more than that in our industry and we need to optimize that because the number of people that complete this one will speak volumes to politicians in the decisions that will be coming down line. So, make sure you conduct the survey that we sent out to you to um, to, the, to you as a broker through our membership and the second one was to your clients there is more reminders coming out but time is closing off and we really want you to do it it's a part of what we're doing to protect your future so you need to help us to help you all righty enough of that okay let's get on with it. let's say a quick thanks to our sponsors who uh, support us from behind the scenes the FBAA is a pretty cool business. We run really efficiently on our own resources, but without sponsors, we can't bring you all the content that we do free of charge. So our thanks and hearts go out to ALI, Bluestone, Finstro, Prosper, Speedy on Deck, Suncorp, our mental health awareness sponsor, Heartland, uh, Affordable Staff, Insurance Advisor Net for the best PI products in the country, Lend, Pepper Money, Travelbook Loans, Credit Fix Solutions, Double AMC, and Strife Financial. These are the people that make it happen for you to get the content that we deliver constantly, whether it's face to face. And yes, we're back at face to face PD days. Don't miss out. Uh, but all those events and things we do are free. Thanks to these people. They're wonderful, wonderful folk. All righty, let's get on to our first guest. And uh, I'd like to welcome this morning the one and only my son. Well, he's not really. It's just an industry joke. Tom Caesar, the founder of Notify. Tom, welcome, son. How are you going? Morning, Dad. How are you? Good, mate. Good. So we better clear that up for everyone. He's not really my son. I'm not his father. It's a joke that started last year, and uh, 
uh, oh, no, the year before now, um, it was 2019, and it's carried on. So, uh, uh, yeah, it gets milked every now and then. But welcome, mate. How you been? Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Been going well. Yeah, really good. It's uh, yeah. it's a lot better, um, a lot better March than last year. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to this year. And, of course, Tom, you're based in Adelaide. Um, everything going okay in South Australia, statewide, with COVID and managing that and getting around and stuff? Yeah, good as gold down here. I think the worst thing we had was uh, the old pizza gate last year with a, a lockdown for a couple of days. So we've been pretty good and we've been back in the office since you know, June last year. It's been as, as usual for us. So um, yeah. we've, we've been quite fortunate, I suppose, a bit like you guys up there. Hey. Oh, that's good to hear, mate. So, Tom, just very quickly, tell us a little bit about your journey and what Notify is about. So, you know, um, you obviously haven't been doing what you do today since you were a kid. So what, what, what was your journey very quickly look like? And tell us a little bit about Notify, and then we've got some questions we need to tackle. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, my, my journey, I started um, in asset finance straight out of high school doing a, a traineeship with a, a, a broken group here in Adelaide and, and wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So planned on taking a gap year and, and ended up sort of going in as an 18-year-old and and doing a bit of a traineeship and, and helping out with the, an asset finance team there and learning how to, to write asset finance. So um, I was one of two uh, of the staff members there that were heading up their, their first digital leads, which was you know, almost 15 years ago now. And, um, you know, I've worked there for a few years. Um, then I had my gap year and, and took off overseas um, to, to sort of travel the world and uh, grow up a little and, and came back and, and took a job with another broking group where I learned more about the the commercial asset side of the business. So um, I was there for about 18 months before um, me and the old man uh, decided to set up a business. He had a mortgage broking background and I had the asset background and um, we formed a positive group at the time and um, focused more predominantly on, on asset finance online, a lot of digital marketing and learned how to build websites and code and, and all sorts of things, which, um, you know, ended up turning into um, five years ago, launching Notify. So, um, oh. Notify was born to, to support mortgage brokers, car dealers, and other finance professionals. Mate, so, excellent. So, are you? Um, so, what is Notify? I, I understand what you do. How do you classify yourselves in the industry? Are you a broker? Are you an aggregator? Are you a facilitator? What? How do you classify yeah, yourselves? We're, we're more of a, a, an, an aggregator slash marketplace that you know we'll, we'll work with um, other aggregators. We'll work with marketplaces. We'll work with brokers. We'll work with dealers. So. We really want to be yeah. that platform that connects asset finance um, with professionals um, and their cu and their customers. So um, you know, we're just continually rolling out new things to, to connect the dots. Yeah, right, that's excellent. No, I've met your dad. What happened to you? He's a lovely man. Did you go <laughs> astray somewhere? <laughs> Jack, he's, a, he's in the office next door. He's, he's still, uh, <laughs> still around the place. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Excellent, excellent. So, mate, let's get down to tin tacks. Um, let's talk about best interest duty where it landed before Christmas. Let's talk about the extension of best interest duty and how you see those things impacting the consumer asset finance space, if I can pick it that way. So when I'm talking about just before Christmas, it was the notification that ASIC gave out as a directive to mortgage brokers. And remember, mortgage brokers and finance brokers are two things that are separated within the best interest duty act i don't agree with the way they've gone about it but it's just something we've got to live with so mortgage brokers those that do homelands finance brokers those that do consumer asset so this notification came out for christmas from asic which i i got on the blow and ripped into them and it's yeah yeah um i'm probably no longer their love son and i'm now in your <laughs> no 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 i'm joking um but um yeah, and so they put out that notice saying that basically mortgage brokers are going to do consumer asset loans at no income, lowest right. possible rate. Um, yeah. My issue was that that then potentially set a precedence if the extension of bid happened, um, how ASIC would then treat that. And, you know, at the moment, the conversation with ASIC is that that's probably how it's going to play out. Yeah. That doesn't work. That is it completely does. wrong. It's absolute BS and it's got to be stopped. Now, I'm working on that stop, and you know that. Um, yep. I'm uh, actually was speaking to the treasurer's office this morning, and I've got to call back after this again. Um, but um, so, yeah, give me your views on what's going on. How are you seeing it's impacting the goods, the bads, the uglies? Give me your, uh, give me the. 
it hasn't been good. It hasn't oh, been good. You know, I think I, I had a good chat with you. You know, was it four days before Christmas, and um, I was meant to go on holidays on that Monday morning, and ended up uh, working that week because of that interpretation, that email. And and what we're seeing is, I think, it was ten days for aggregators, for brokers, and lenders to to basically prepare the whole mortgage broking market for that. And um, there was a lot of panic, especially uh, in January. Um, there was um, We've seen a huge increase. We've got two pieces on our platform, which are a tick and flicks, which we take care of the whole process and a mortgage broker can complete a full application. We've seen a big increase in tick and flicks because there's a lot of fear around whether they're doing the right thing or not, because there just simply yep. wasn't enough time to digest um, you know, being able to plan for it. And, and that goes for lenders as well. We know that lenders are now looking to roll out new products and um, that have got mm. set commission and things like that. But um, it just, it, it's hard for them when there's one set of rules for mortgage brokers, one set of rules um, for asset brokers. And then we've got car dealers sitting over here with a point of sale exemption, which isn't being brought into the mix. So we've got three different sets of rules at the moment, which is, is a challenge to navigate. And um, yeah. it's, it's an unfair playing field and and i think it so, really so needs everyone yeah so that everybody understands so what happened was through the treasury's consultation on um, the extension of best interest duty um, treasury advised that motor vehicle dealers would be carved out of the obligation now although i don't agree with it i do understand the reason why and, and the problem becomes is in the the best interest duty for mortgage brokers going back to that space mortgage managers were carved out. So they basically, the lender or monostream or whatever. Um, car dealers running under a, um, a uh, uh, the, the heads of agreements they have with their financiers um, is a similar parallel. I don't agree with it. I can sort of see where the logic came in, but it's not right. So we're still arguing, but you know, it's one of those things that you can understand that how they got to that point. Link credit providers agreement was the word I was looking for before. That's what car dealers operate under. Uh, it, uh, I must be getting a bit slow in my old age. I couldn't quite get it quick enough. <laughs> um, but um, the whole that that piece between um, finance brokers and mortgage brokers um, operating under the same rule, from a legislative point of view, not that any of this should have gone there because it's beyond the Financial Services Royal Commission. The Financial Services Royal Commission. I only spoke about home loans, nothing else. Not credit cards, because that's another bitch. Um, not motor finance, uh, consumer asset finance, only home loans. Yet they've gone beyond that. And unfortunately, it's it's not something anyone could have stopped, but they made a decision and they just had a head up of steam and certain people within just didn't want to listen to anything else. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the that's challenging, but the legislation probably isn't wrong to make it the same for everybody whatever you're doing in consumer land right just as a thinking at it as a regulatory yeah, piece definitely the single biggest problem with all of this isn't treasury isn't the legislation it's what asic does with it and we've Correct. seen this that's what happened in december and the, yep. the asic is meant to be the policeman politicians um uh, you know uh, construct what the law should be Treasury writes the law, right? So they do all that legal jargon BS behind the scenes. ASIC is the policeman. ASIC is not the law writer. Yet ASIC is repeatedly showing they are writing laws in as far as the regulatory guidance they give goes beyond the intent of government or beyond the legislation as written. Now, the credit card piece is a classic example. That was a paragraph, and I can't remember the clause, I think it was 3.6, uh, forget that. I, there's a paragraph in there in the legislation. I actually think it's 33.6 something, but whatever it is, um, that ASIC took half a paragraph and created the rulings for credit cards and disregarded the second half of the paragraph that balanced out how that was meant to be. I mean, that's just wrong. I've expressed this to ASIC and I've now expressed it publicly. It was in the media the other day. Um, it's the same responsible lending. You know, <clears throat> There's, there's, there was a, a media article, I think it was yesterday in the Australian, where a journalist explained responsible lending. First person to get it right as a journalist. Responsible lending isn't going away. It's going back to how it used to be governed through APRA. The piece through ASIC is a problem. This ASIC piece needs to be fixed. And I'm deeply, deeply concerned for you guys in the consumer asset space, which is why um, 
twice a week at the moment. I'm onto the treasurer's office trying to. Sort so, what, what, what do you see is the So, what do you see is the best solution going forward for them? Bugger off and leave it alone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, when when uh, it came out, obviously never. Um, yeah. No one really expected that email to come out that week before Christmas with their interpretation, which means they're really the only ones that were interpreting it that way. So is there a chance it can go back um, or is it going to be here to there stay? Is, there is a possibility, but it's a, it's a hard one to push back on. Now, you've got to remember, and this is where Westpac won their case last year about hemp, what ASIC gives is regulatory guidance. It actually isn't the law. The problem is to fight ASIC, you want to have a few million dollars in your pocket and a handful of QCs to fight them, right? And I don't know how much ASIC spent, but I reckon if they spent less than 10 mil, they got out of it cheap in their case against ASIC. We can't do that as an industry. We don't have that surplus just sitting in the hip pocket. Well, not many of us, but many of Why sure don't, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, that's what it takes to fight it. Now, it is com completely commercially unreasonable to say to anyone, you need to work for nothing. There's no commercial logic in that whatsoever. And um, that's where the fight is. There are answers to it. And I know you touched on it. I actually don't want to dwell on it because in case we have regulators listening or government politicians listening, I don't want to give them the answer as to how to fix the problem. But the reality is based on where the Royal Commission landed, consumer asset finance should never ever have been touched. And the simple reality, if you are gonna to touch it, whether we like it or not, and you say, okay, well, we're, we're gonna get caught. We can't change that from a legislative point of view, but you can never expect anybody to work for nothing. That is just absolutely ludicrous. Otherwise, yeah. there'd be no politician in this country that'd, get, that'd earn a dollar because everything they put out is probably needs to be looked at again. <laughs> That's a bit harsh, but anyhow. <laughs> the, flex, the flex commissions and all the changes that were in the, the consumer asset space yeah. two or three years ago, which was pre-Royal Commission, had sort of made a lot of those changes already. To so it's, it's almost like a second wave of that again, which you know, causes a, a, you know, a lot of frustration for the whole industry just to know what's coming, I suppose. Yeah, so that changes in flex those years ago. We were very close to that because, as you know, I used to do F&I in a car yards. In actual fact, I used to do F&I across four car yards in my younger days. Uh, so I'm very close to that. Now, chairman today is a, uh, a recently passed dealer principal of one of the largest dealers in this country for the space that he was in. So we're, we're very engaged on this, very concerned about it. We know it intimately. Uh, and um, the idea about changing flex um, made some consumer protection sense. It meant that just because you could charge somebody 10% commission didn't mean you should. And I sat in car yards where the, the DH detector was out going, dut, 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 he'll take 10%, dut, 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 shit, I'll only get away with three here. Um, that should never be allowed. So having the cap saying you cannot go high was a good thing, but still mm. commercially having the ability to come down if you want to do a Christmas special or whatever. But that was never the intent to say that you should write the cheapest rate possible with no commission mm. in it. I bet you, you know, the, there's no power is going to do that. Mm, mm. Well, the, the cheapest rate's never the right, never, it's not always the right solution either. Uh, there's a lot more that comes into a deal with early repayment penalties and, um, you know, whether you can make extra repayments and things like that. So there, there are a lot of other things that come into it now. Yeah. So it, it's a really good point because um, it's not just, and I'm going to generalise, it's not just a car loan, mm. right? There's other things that need to be considered for you um, as to what works, what doesn't, what are the fees and charges that may or may not apply. As you say, can you pay it out early? What's the penalty if you do? What, what else is bundled into that could be restrictive for you or inappropriate for you? And uh, again, that's why brokers are the professionals of this industry. They're the ones who can actually give guidance on that, uh, mm. whether it be a car loan or whether it be a home loan. And I'm using car loans just as a generic, yeah. instead of saying consumer asset finance, which is really long-winded, car loans is easier. Uh, we could say personalised, but that tends to take most people to the unsecured space, which is bigger than that. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's a real challenge. Um, what are you planning for in your business with this at the moment? Yeah, so we're, we're planning for a bit of everything, to be honest. I think over the next six months, we 
you know, whether we see some some changes or not, um, we're, yep. you know, a new platform we're launching, which is a lot more flexible, um, and it gives us the, the flexibility for um, whatever's to come, essentially. So yep. we, we think the, the technology over the next 12 months is going to play a big piece here in making sure we're, put, we're bringing forward the data for a, a mortgage broker to clearly identify the right options for their customers, um, make sure they're asking the right, right right questions and producing the right documents and, and all those sorts so, of things. Yeah, so that, that's, a, I guess, a, a pitch to where Christmas ended up. If you're yeah. a mortgage broker, um, you're probably better off to um, refer this to someone who's not captured um, and uh, have a referral arrangement of sorts, whatever that is, rather than trying to do it yourself and knowing you're doing it for nothing. And and I guess the thing is that, you know, and, I, and I, I'm going to say this for the, the broader marketplace to, and to mortgage brokers, make sure you're dealing with someone you trust. Uh, I know I trust Tom, but I'm not just throwing that as the pitch, but it's really, really important that if you're gonna entrust your customer to someone else, that you get close and understand who that person, who that business is, to make sure they do the right thing by your client. Uh, yep. That's very important. Uh, so, uh, mate, um, Interesting times ahead. Like I said, my battles in at uh, the treasurer's office level, because ASIC reports to the treasury or to the treasurer, I should say, um, <laughs> have been going. Yeah, has been going since uh, Christmas and since I got back from leave in January. Um, and it's never an easy journey. But what we've got to ensure um, is that we don't bring a negative influence that will disadvantage consumers. Correct. And I believe what they're proposing at the moment does. It leaves consumers in the hands with car dealers. And when I grew up as a, as a young guy, and then when I first started broking in the late 80s, early 90s, Parramatta used car salesmen. That's what they were. And that's where we're going to leave them in the hands of. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that is not necessarily a good outcome and or just in the hands of the banks that sit behind them or the manufacturer lenders. That is not necessarily the best outcome. So it's a voting but... choice. The, the big four banks, we, we get a lot of business from them quoting consumer deals because they, they generally don't do a consumer car loan. They offer a personal loan unsecured for a car loan, which quite often is above 10%. So we actually oh, wow. win a lot of business off customers going to the big four and then inquiring you know, with us. So yeah. I think that's a really good example of the big four banks not actually being geared for it. Yeah, and also proves they're not professionals at giving the guidance. You know, this mm. is one of the upsides of the best interest duty is that brokers always have, but now there is a reg for duty sits around it, you must put your client's interest first, right? Jamming somebody with 10% or more on an unsecured personal loan is not in their best interest. Uh, Correct. We all need to remember that. It's a part of our, our pitch to the marketplace these days when we're talking to clients, one of the reasons why you deal with a mortgage broker or with a broker, not just a mortgage broker. Buddy, as I said, uh, flag before we went into this, our time will go quickly and uh, I've already got Mariah giving me the <laughs> conversation at the moment. Um, lovely to chat with you. And we're going to keep having this conversation, my friend, because um, this is critically important as a part of the future of our industry. Because although it has a significant impact on the, the consumer asset finance space, um, it has an impact on the mortgage broker space as well. And these yep. things need to be right. It, it is just commercially ludicrous for a regulator to expect anybody to work for no income. It just doesn't happen unless they're going to volunteer their time as a regulator. Maybe that's different. Maybe we shouldn't be paying our annual licensing fees um, because, <laughs> hey, you know, everybody's got to work for free these days. You get that one across the line? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm probably going to get belted for that comment later somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we all live with it. Um, but you know what I mean? Um, but mate, um, we will stay in close touch as we always do, but more so as these conversations progresses. Thank you so much for joining us today. Lovely to chat to you. Good to see Thank everything's you. going well and we will keep uh, preparing and planning and fighting the fight that's in front of us. Um, and the problem is it's always the next fight, but this one is critically important. We'll get it right. So take care, my friend. Thanks for having me, Cheers. No worries, mate. Cheers. All righty, Tom Caesar from Notify. What a great guy. Um, now to our next guest, uh, I'd like to welcome Kitty Parker, who's joining us. And Kitty is the founder and director of Kitty and Miles, a buyer's agency. Kitty, welcome. How are you going? 
I'm good, mate. How are you doing this morning? You're really on your soapbox today, aren't you, Pete? Oh, the, yeah, the Q&A does it to me. That's all right. It's all good. Uh, to, look, thanks so much for joining us. You're looking oh. very relaxed there. You went through a few stress moments a little earlier before we got on, Karen. So oh, I'm sort of I was glad changing that, contracts right before getting on here, and I'm like, how do I get this done in like 20 seconds before coming <laughs> on? All done. All done. All done. Right. All good. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All done. So, um, Kitty, um, before we get into a bit more conversation on buyer advocacy uh, within uh, um, real estate purchase, um, give us a little bit of back, background about yourself, what your journey has been a little like. Um, um, love your accent. You're obviously not an Aussie. Maybe tell us a little bit about that as well. Well, uh, you may yeah. be a, a, now an Aussie. Uh, you you know what? I know you'll like this one. I'm actually uh, Brizzy born and bred. Right. Brizzy. So when I was little, you betcha. I know people you never sister. guess that one, mate. They never do. No. So, so what happened? Was there, <laughs> was there when I was little, but then yeah. you left and then, you know, spent obviously time overseas. Yeah. So, but Brizzy's where um, I was born. So that's yeah. my, my base. So technically yeah. I'm an Aussie. Yeah. But anyway. Well, there you go. That puts me back on the box. Well done. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I know people never expect that one. So um, nah. off on a tangent, when we've got the state of yeah. origin, you know, I'm based in Sydney now. So when we have the state of origin and I'm going for the Maroons, everyone's like, what? 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 And I'm like, you know what? These are the times where I get to say I'm a Queenslander. So, <laughs> I know that battle well. I, um, I'm born yeah. and bred from Sydney. And yeah. uh, and I was a, I'm a Northern Beaches boy. Since I was a young kid, I followed Manly. So when the normal NRL league's going, I'm usually supporting Manly, which I get dumped on big time. Yeah. And then I'm considered a hypocrite because when State of Origin's on, um, if I don't back Queensland, my wife will cut my head off. So there's certainly a oh. diplomatic play that has to happen there. Yeah. <laughs> Let me say I'm pretty much the only one here that backs the maroons for the for the uh, state of origin so i'm really like the minority over here but anyway don't worry we we've got your back you'll be right <laughs> oh good mate but um okay on to uh what you mentioned on to serious serious Sorry. topic here okay so uh yes i'm a buyer's advocate so i support probably a lot of your listeners clients my role is to support um home buyers and not always first home buyers can be next home buyers investor buyers self-managed super fund property buyers mm. i support people in the purchase of their property so as to provide a bit of a level playing field when we're looking at uh, you know sales agents supporting vendors and um, their client in the buying of property i come in to the corner of the property buyer to advocate mm. for them to get the best deal possible, to help them access properties they can't necessarily access themselves, and just to make the whole process as stress-free as possible for the property buyer. So that's my role. I'm the director of Kitty and Miles. I have a, a smashing team behind me, so I can't say. I think sometimes people think it's me, and I go, "May it's it's not me." If it weren't for my team behind me and my my buyers agents with me, you know, we wouldn't be doing half as good for property buyers as we do. That's excellent. Um, so tell me, tell me a little bit about the Kitty journey. What, what did you do oh, in the past to get to where you are today? Just in a, a quick headline. Yep, yep, okay. Well, look, I come from a background, trained psychologist. Um, I'm an ex-academic, so I was doing my doctorate at uni actually in business. So funnily enough, that's my background. Um, fast forward, I'll cut out all, all the middle ground there, but as a property investor, coming from being a single parent, et cetera, I recognize myself just how tough it was to purchase property and how as a woman, single mom, et cetera, the, the industry really didn't speak to me. You know, mm. I was really left out in the cold. So when I sold my last business and I was thinking of what to do, I went, you know, light bulb moment. I really wish I'd had a buyer's advocate in my corner through my property journey um, because dealing with sales agents and just trying to buy property on my own was really difficult. Mm. So voila, Kitty and Miles was born. Um, 
And so I really try and speak for those that aren't necessarily spoken to in this space. So obviously, yeah. you know, we're open and we work with everyone. But my my passion in what I do is helping home buyers that really feel they don't have someone in their corner. And so okay. whether that's a single parent, whether that's um, just people that don't fit into the the typical box of, of being so, a typical home buyer. Yeah. So that actually plays into where I wanted to um, talk to you about next as to really what is it that a buyer's advocate does and what's the advantage or disadvantage um, yeah. of somebody using it? Obviously, and, and you touched on it just then. Um, and when you speak to if you're a single parent and, and so on, or, you know, um, I could see having someone in your corner as a really valuable thing. Uh, can you just expand a bit more yeah. about yeah. what a buyer's advocate does and, and what advantage yeah. that brings? Yeah, I got you. I guess for a lot of your listeners, the best way to compare this is if you have a client that goes, like let's say we have someone that's looking to get a mortgage, what's the difference between going directly to a lender like the big four compared to going to a mortgage broker? And I go, you know what, can they go to a lender direct? Yep. Are they going to get the best deal? Are they going to be supported? Is there someone really working in their corner on their particular case, on their particular file, or do they kind of get lost in the strip, the slip stream? So, as we'd say, there's benefits for a client to actually have a broker working as one of their team players on their side. Mm. It's similar when it comes to a property purchase. So can someone buy a property on their own? Yep, they can. They can go out there, they can look at advertising, they can contact a sales agent directly and do it themselves. Will they necessarily get the best price? Will they necessarily get the most favorable outcome terms? Will they have access to the volume of properties or you know, tick off all the due diligence they need to tick mm. off if they're doing it on their own? The answer to that could be maybe, but likely not. So when you have someone like myself or a buyer's agent slash buyer's advocate on board, you really have someone that's making sure all boxes are ticked in your favor, as well as mm. opening you up to the ability to have access to more properties than you'd likely find just through public portals online. Uh, we make sure all, you know, settlement terms, everything in a contract of sale, uh, building pest inspections, strata inspections, etc. Mm. All of that is geared in line to ensure that the property buyer is buying in their best interests. Sure. So, so I mean, it's a great have, analogy. Have someone in your, in your corner, Go similar yeah. to a mortgage broker. Yeah, I was about to say, it's a great analogy to that of what a, a mortgage broker or a broker does. Uh, and I think that will resonate with everybody watching that, that to understanding how that parallel works. Um, do, do you guys assist clients with negotiating the price on a house at all? Is, is that a part of what Spot you on. do? That's a part of it. And that's probably a huge part of it. Yeah. So because we know, uh, you know, we deal with this every day and we have access to data and research portals, mm. we will know the realistic value of a property in the current market. So we're able to educate and inform clients as to the true value of a property. So they're yeah. not trying to sift through, you know, marketing material or sales agent, you know, as you said before, you know, BS talk. We're able yeah. to really like nut down and drill down and say, this is the true value of the property in this market. You don't have imagine, to rely on all, all this other yeah. fluff. I imagine that'd be really tricky in this um, COVID and post-COVID style of environment. Um, I know up here in Queensland, we're seeing properties where you could say, yeah, okay, it would normally sell for this, but because of a, an increased demand from interstate, people wanting to move up or to buy interstate, uh, people who want to move out of metro areas, there's some really crazy prices being commanded, not just advertised or asked for, actually being mm -hmm. achieved. I imagine yeah. um, having someone like yourself, uh, because none of us have experienced this style of thing, but having someone like yourself who can bring another 
aspect to this becomes a balance between getting the best possible price, knowing that things are possibly, for the moment, selling a little bit above what they possibly should do. And is, there be a, is that a challenging thing in the, due to the current market, which I believe will settle down, don't get me wrong. Mm. Um, yeah, got you. I don't see it's all anything, but at the moment, I would think, geez, that'd be a real, um, I really want somebody who knows their stuff in my corner, yeah? Yeah, you're, you're spot on. And I think there's a real disparity as well where, where, well, at least I can say in New South Wales, that the disparity mm. between an advertised price guide yeah. and the actuality as to what something is selling for at auction, pre-auction or via private treaty. Yeah. So what you've got there is a real gap in knowledge and a gap in expectations with people buying property as to, you know, we think it's worth X because the marketing's mm. saying this, but the reality mm. is it's selling for Y. What on earth is going on here? And I'm sure that on a national level is really being experienced um, to some extent as well. So you're mm. correct that having someone come in that's able to proactively undertake negotiations in, we'll call it a strong seller's market, so still hmm. having someone that's able to advocate for a buyer to help bridge that gap and help bridge those expectations as well to be able to, you know what, even what it boils down to at the moment, even be able to close a deal full stop. Properties yeah. are selling so quickly at the moment that a lot of the time you have uh, some of your listeners, their clients will likely be saying, you know, we find a property yet we're getting our finance sorted, yet we're ready to go, oh, it's sold. And that's happening yeah. more and more. So people are just missing out. So is that they, a part of, the, yeah, is that a part of like a cause and effect for higher prices that things are being sold for? Because of the, uh, yeah, the heat of demand? It is, it is. So what tends to come in, I tend to find in the property market, and you know, others may disagree with me, but this is my experience, and I'm gonna stand on yeah. my soapbox for a moment here. That go ahead. Market economy and um, the national economy drives the property market far, far less than buyer mm. confidence. It really is. The media tries to portray that, you know, when the economy is, you know, in recession, oh, goodness me, property prices are going to plummet. Or, you know, oh, when, you know, uh, the, pro the national economy is doing well, oh, prices are going to go up. And it's really not the case. It's really got to do with supply and demand and also home buyer or property buyer confidence. So at the moment, we have low stock levels. We have high consumer and home buyer confidence. And that's brought about through, you know, low interest rates, you know, RBA cash rates, um, the incentives that the government and private um, corporate have you know, put into mm. place since COVID. So all of this is, you know, quote unquote, free money, so to speak. And so people are going, wow, we can get mortgages really cheap. Now's the time to get in. So everyone wants to get into the market. There's great buyer confidence there, a lack of stock. What's happening? FOMO, really, it's a fear of missing out. Home buyers, you know, are mm. missing out. As you say, it's cause and effect. It's very much the more people miss out, the more they feel desperate, the more they fear the property prices are just going to surge even more and they're, they're going to miss out on buying their home. And so they start mm. going, okay, we're going to throw everything at it. We're going to get in there quick and throw everything at it. Next minute we have pricing go up. We have comparable sales in the market, you know, being shown that they're achieving top dollar premium price points of yeah. sales. And it just perpetuates. Is there a, a bit of, is there any mass that sits behind that at the moment that sort of says that um, the disparity between an advertised price and an actual sold price is roughly X percent up or down? And oh, or I can say that because we data? calculate that. Yes, yeah, spot on. We yeah. calculate that data. So as far as media, I'll be really honest, media is here saying at the moment, you know, we're looking at double digit growth in 2021, mm. you know, price guys, there is a disparity there. By my yeah. company's calculations, at the moment, I can say in the Sydney property market, that's sitting between 25 and 35%. 
which is ridiculous. Like, really, honestly. Above so, advertised or below? Above advertised. Wow. Isn't so that... So you have to something for a million bucks, it's going for one and a quarter. Okay. More. You, usually, let's say if there's a property go, you know, being advertised for a million bucks, it's going yeah. for about at least 1.25 up to 1.35. It, it's a ridiculous oh. disparity. So, you know, yeah. your listeners, clients, the notion of them likely missing out with regard yeah. to their acquisition it, is yeah. pretty high. Geez, I, I can't wait for the heat to go out of this because it's creating an unrealistic pricing market. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that will create problems in, you know, call it five years from now, all of a sudden people who bought at that level, their, their properties either haven't appreciated or um, may have even gone down from what they purchased for. Uh, yeah. Who knows? But, you know, when you, when it's a bit like the GFC, when you overheat a marketplace, it has this nasty backlash or scorpion's tail after the event yeah. that isn't a fun ride. Um, yeah. So I guess this is where people need to be cautious that the heat of the moment, the fear of missing out um, has got to balance out, I guess, to um, the reality of what something's truly worth, where you need a professional to guide you on that. Absolutely. Uh, the uh, market will contract, you know, yeah. it's not likely to contract for, I would say, a couple of years, <clears throat> but there will be market yeah. contraction. and. It tends to affect the the smaller markets more so than the larger markets. So I would foresee, you know, there'll be such growth that any contraction in, you know, Sydney and Melbourne market, you know, it'll contract but then likely surge. Yeah. But it's the smaller markets, you know, in particular off the top of my head, I'm thinking, you know, Adelaide and Perth and areas like yeah. that. You know, we've seen the Perth market, what has happened uh, since the GFC with the Perth market. That's a prime example where mm -hmm. we've seen markets go up, 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 up. And then over the, you know, next say eight years or, or so, it just mm -hmm. contracted and it, it bottomed out probably, you know, it started at its uphill climb again. But for yeah. people purchased in say, I'm gonna take a stab and say 2011 or 2010, and then looking at, from there to 2018, there was a mm. massive drop, like massive. Yeah. 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 So yes, it does pay to have a professional in your corner that's able to negotiate effectively, not even, yeah. you know, just in these markets, even in a market that's an easier market, knowing that you're getting a good deal and knowing that you have someone in your corner that's able to tick everything off, with regard to due yeah. diligence um, and coordinate with your broker. Like I, I'm always liaising with brokers as well. Yeah. So any paperwork they may require uh, when it comes to contract exchange, uh, rental appraisals, when it comes to investment property purchases, um, yeah. all of that, you know, having okay. someone that's able to go back and forth and just coordinate and project manage that is sure. pretty handy. Excellent. Um, I've unfortunately run out of time, but very quickly, is there any deliberate underquoting going on by real estate agents? Uh, uh, you know, there may be a, oh. I'm pricing this and it's it's selling for that as a consequence of FOMO, more so than anything else. Um, but is there any deliberate underquoting going on okay. or is that not really an impact? I have to be very careful with what I say here, right? Sure. Before I get shot, right? But I'm I'm all for I'm a pretty straight shooter. So yeah. I think there is deliberate underquoting. I think there's yeah. a real um there's encouragement in a market such as this for sales agents to pop in what I would feel is a very unrealistic low price point to encourage potential buyers to come to open inspections, et cetera, et cetera, and get attached to a particular property. And therefore, the effect of that is higher competition at auction, higher competition when it comes to a sale. And that FOMO will, con will considerably yeah. drive up the end price. Yeah, that emotional I feel... Yeah, I feel that an agent really, even though they're working for their vendor, 
when yeah. it comes to the industry overall, there should be a duty of care there. That when it comes to consumers, well, there is technically with fair trading, uh, they're not yeah. meant to quote, you know, the quoting's meant to be within 10%. So yeah. if they list a price guide, that it's meant to be anticipated that that uh, end sales figure is neither yeah. greater than 10% below or 10% above. above. And that's yeah. rubbish. Like it's absolute rubbish. I'm seeing, and I've seen even before the market of the last few months, in Sydney, it's usually 20%, you know, 20% yeah. below the sales price, the end sales yeah. price. And now with the current market, it, it's more so. So I feel it's um, mm. there's a bit of a we, lack we of should, integrity. I think I think we need to talk offline further and maybe a discussion. Yeah, with, don't get me uh, shot okay. over this one, mate. No, like, right, but I'll that's my two a, cents on it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a bullet. But uh, I think there needs to be a conversation with fair trading if that's what's going on in the current marketplaces because it's distorting a market nationally Absolutely. potentially. Yeah. Anyhow, we will have that mm -hmm. conversation. Um, Thanks, Kitty, man. it has been so lovely having you joining us this morning. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day. I know you got a You're lot so on. Welcome. Uh, You're so welcome. And I will Thank welcome, you. with your agreement, to continue our conversation on the property market because I find it extremely interesting. I'm sure everybody watching finds it extremely interesting as well um, and to gain your insight. And of course, you're doing some special things for members of FBAA. So uh, I sure am. Look I sure our am. Area and you'll find Kitty in there. and. She'll be able to uh, look after you in a special way as a member of the FBW. Like Kitty, thank you so much. Look forward no, to speaking soon. You're so welcome. We... Thank you. Pleasure. We will continue that fair trading conversation. Take care. Rightio. You I need too. to move Bye. on to our... Bye. I need to uh, move on to our next guest, who's actually uh, deemed on my spreadsheet. Oh, there it is on the slide. As the beauty out of our uh, brawn, brains, and beauty. I actually think the brains and beauty was Kitty. To be honest with you, uh, but we couldn't leave. Blake left out, so he's the most handsome one here. So out of the out of the men, we'll call him the beauty. Welcome, buddy. Yeah, thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Good to be here. <laughs> Great to have you, mate. Um, our conversations today, uh, except for Kitty, are largely around best interest duty, RLOs, so responsible lending, um, the extension, and uh, design and distribution obligations is a part of the conversation as well, but not necessarily one we need to dive into today. But um, Mate, um, oh, before we go too far, I better get, get get that quick snapshot of who Blake is. Um, mate, give me a little history of your journey and tell me what you're doing today, and then we'll get into some questions. Yeah, right, Pete. Well, thank you. So, uh, married, four kids, puppy dog, Kenhurst, New South Wales is where I live, 40 kilometres or so out of the CBD. I work for Specialist Finance Group, been around the game for, you know, around about 20 years or so. Um, half of that, I was proud and privileged to be a broker. I uh, had an unwinding at about GFC, so I ended up at the banks for a couple of years. Um, and for the last decade, I've been working uh, pretty much in distribution and aggregation. Um, and I love I love this industry. I love growing aggregation businesses and, and working closely with groups so more Australian consumers can get uh, help from a broker. Very good. That was quick. Nice snapshot, Blake. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Thanks, John. Short, short and fast. <laughs> short, short and to the point. That's the key. Um, there's lots of things happening in that conversation around best interest duty. Uh, and obviously that has now been enacted for mortgage brokers as of um, the 1st of January. And I, I do have a question here that I missed before. So for the extension of the best interest duty to impact the consumer asset finance space, is at this stage tagged as being September of this year? There's some conversation, it's October, but yeah, we're sort of waiting the outcomes of what, what's already transpired in the Senate. We've got to hear more from Treasury. But it'll be around the September mark before that impacts. Um, but that does change our world. Um, I can be a little bit, um, blase is not the right word, but yeah, this is my 43rd year, I think, this year in the industry. And throughout that time, regulation has constantly changed. It's been never ending. And every time it changes, it becomes more. And I've had some questions here about, you know, this, when is this going to stop? I hate to say it, but it never stops. And uh, this is why we have people like me, people like associations, where, and, and what aggregators do and Blake's do, and do with his work is we're constantly working with these things that it keeps us going. But um, it, it's always a challenging difficulty with things coming out. How are you guys, how, or how are you going from your perspective um, with the best interest duty? Are you comfortable where that's landing for yourselves? Um, and uh, 
what are your thoughts about responsible lending obligations out of curiosity? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot in that, so I'll unpack it maybe there a little is. bit at a time. Um, so first things first, you say, when will it end? It never will. Um, gee, That's we're right. getting close to that, I mean, um, you know, from 2015 onwards with the broker enumeration review by ASIC, uh, Sedgwick uh, inquiry, Royal Commission, uh, you and I uh, and, and my counterparts and peers throughout the industry uh, jumping into the trenches together uh, throughout 2018 and have a decision reversed um, or, or an instruction by uh, a commission reversed was an amazing feat. Um, mm. We were regarded well from other industries as well at that time. Financial planners stood together and said, Jesus, guys, how did we let FOFA and FOFA 2 happen? Look at the brokers and what they've been able to achieve. We need to work together and get some common sense across, across the line here. Um, so we did an exceptional job in turning that around. And basically what we got on the back of that was a mandate for what we do. Um, you know, brokers get paid, they do an amazing job. Yes, we're gonna implement this uh, best interest duty. You know, I've got reservations about how well a best interest duty can work. However, I've got no reservations about what brokers do and that's always uh, working in the customer's best interest anyway. Um, so that's all fine. I think um, we're in dangerous territory with the extension. I think um, because mm. once it creates a consumer asset, what other areas of commercial business does it creep into? Uh, you and I both know that New South Wales had built this into their Free Fair Trading Act by extension of definition changes to the ACL last year. So that took effect in uh, July uh, 1st last year. Um, and so uh, by right, some consumer and commercial brokers are already in breach of the New South Wales Act, which is, um, mm. which is surprising and, and concerning. I think the extension will set a dangerous precedent, but I think again, if we unify and work through it, lending partners as an example, setting a benchmark for commissions uh, across product lines, I think that will go a long way to reduce two tier or three tier systems. Uh, I think there is much more work to be done there. With regards to yeah. bid and its implementation, uh, we had all of 2020 uh, really to start working on what we thought it would look and feel like. We deployed ours in say September. Uh, yes, it's more work. Uh, yeah, there's more responsibility, more educational requirements. But like I said, brokers were largely doing it anyway. It's more so around the mm -hmm. documentation of what they're doing. Um, we haven't seen too many troubles with the implementation of BID. That's excellent. And, and it is a fair point. I mean, it, and it's a question that's come through as well about, yeah, we, we now have to do all this more work, but we don't get paid more. And, and I know I've said this before through the Royal Commission period, but unfortunately not out the back end of it. For now, it's about protecting your income. Don't put your hand out for more just yet, even though in my mind, I believe you're entitled to it, but let's protect what we've got. And we've got the 2022 remuneration review, which uh, I mentioned earlier about some research that I'm making sure everybody gets done, is to talk to that together with other research. We've just spent a huge amount of money in my mind anyhow, um, over the last few months to do some international uh, research, both uh, across the country and globally, to all talk back to protecting that. And um, well, well, it well, always seems to be more. Yeah, Petty, just on that. So, you know, when will it end? Going back to your original comments is uh, we've got nearly a mandate on what we do and how we do it, the service that we offer. Um, the last thing is the remuneration review that kicks off next year. Uh, and mm. once that is checked off, we should have some clear air for some time. We're the channel of choice. We work in a consumer's best interest and we've had our remuneration mandated and ticked off by uh, the government bodies yeah. as well. As, as far as those bigger pieces concerned, yes, but there are always new pieces coming through year in year out um, you know I can remember a time where I was lucky to do five papers to a regulator or government a year I can do that in two months it doesn't that the constant change doesn't stop the big pieces and especially the focus on remuneration has to stop this has been going for seven nearly eight years when we get to the end of this journey it's ridiculous um, hey are you finding um, that there's been an impact on new blood entering the industry. I mean, I know as we went to the Royal Commission, we, we saw that pull back. Um, COVID probably pulled it back. And some people who were thinking about retirement said, bugger this, I'm over it and I'm out. But with new entrants, are you seeing new entrants coming in to whatever degree that is? Or do you see that is that dried up basically? I'm not just talking about specialists, I'm just talking industry in general. Yeah, so for, for specialists, we um, we tend not to recruit too many new to industry brokers unless they've got uh, a banking background. Um, and it's really been about, you know, the statistics of new to industry brokers failing in the first two years and, you know, their adherence to compliance measures. What we do is not a simple task, you know. 
Yeah. Um, so we've put a, a lot more rigor around what we get as new to, uh, industry entrants into our business. Yeah. Across the board though, um, yeah, look, I, I sense that it has dried up a little bit, and it, but, but certainly where you're recruiting brokers from or where brokers are joining from, um, now tend to have more of a financial services background, whether it be banking or, or you know, Insto or investment banking or um, high net worth customer management banking. Yeah. Um, so we're seeing that level increase significantly. Yeah, it's interesting. We and I agree. We see it from sort of standing back from you know, being more across a, a broader platform. Um, certainly, Royal Commission and COVID pulled that new entrance piece right back. Uh, we are seeing that that is increasing, um, and it is increase, it increasing across the board from our perspective at, at quite a healthy rate. So uh, um, there's a lot of confidence. And I think what you said before about the outcomes of Royal Commissions and what we lobbied, what we landed on, is all very supportive of this being one hell of a great industry. Uh, uh, hey, what do you guys do? And it's a question I've got here under a best interest duty. If there is only one option for a borrower that they can consider, how is that best dealt with? So, you know, we always try and find the multiple options, but say it's a Sharia loan or it's a reverse mortgage, there may only be one or two. How, what, what's, your views on how that is best handled? Well, I mean, the, the duty goes on to say, you've got to issue the best, the, the product that's best suited for their needs that's available to you. And if there's only one, it's a matter of documentation. Um, and not only documenting why, but uh, documenting about your educational component to the customer to make sure that yeah. you have it documented, um, that you've spoken to the customer about why they only satisfy one lender's um, policies, okay. um, mm. what you've spoken to the customer about. So you cover off that way, mate. Uh, and that, uh, yeah, excellent. And it, it's something new too, in as far as not the documentation piece, the documentation has become more and more thorough. And from my point of view, I get, I'd get a client to sign anything and everything. I want their signature on the bloody paper. Uh, but, um, you know, that, that education piece is, is one of the, the newer pieces in a certain respect that, that in one, one hand, we've probably always done it, but not necessarily thought to the extent we probably need to now is to make sure that they completely understand why this is, or if they change their mindset as to whatever is causing that restriction, if there is a possibility, there are more options to consider. So that education piece is really important. Um, it's also a good segue to my, hang on. I think, I, think, I think it is really important. I think in some respects though, there's a bit of overreach there. I mean, you know, the, the guides go, go in to explain that a broker needs to educate possibly clients for products that don't suit them and teach yeah. them the reasons why. I mean. I mean, really, is that is that what we really need to do? Um, under the bid guidelines, right. yes, in some cases we do, but is it necessary yeah. and should it be? Possibly not. Yeah. And, and it goes to the conversations that you and I have had with you know stakeholders, government, ASIC, and, and everything over the course of the last few years. Bid will be um, a work in progress. It will change. Yeah. Um, it'll have additions and maybe it might have some uh, retractions as well. Yeah, yeah very, very right. Um, it's interesting because I've got a question here, which is actually directed at me, but it plays back to what we're talking about, is what are the top three priorities uh, for 2021 with the FBAA? And, um, you know, it, really our priorities revolve around responding to the research we did last year and the research we've done early this year, which is all about protecting revenues, helping brokers to build better businesses and give them much better education uh, options for them to grow their businesses. And uh, that then plays back to how they can better help their borrowers. Now, some of this is stuff that we're not going to over, um, overlap what any aggregator does. But you know, these are things that brokers are asking us to do. And of course, we continue our, our lobbying activities. We, we don't put anyone between us and the politicians or the regulators. And so the extension of bid, as I've already spoken about today, is an enormous issue to everyone that needs to be resolved. Responsible lending, it, it's, you know, basically it's done but it's how it gets governed is the problem. And you touched on it a moment ago of that overreaching. Who's doing the overreaching? Hmm. Well, I think, My I think conversation we all know. continues with Treasury about ASIC. Well, that's what I am. So, but, but it's very, it's very apt. I mean, it's, these are things that keep us awake at night and, and we need to oh, try and resolve. Oh, look, I mean, if, if, as an industry, um, my, my focus, I mean, bid is nearly done and we will continue to work through yeah. the measures of that extension of that, et cetera. Um, we're yeah. working with lending partners in that asset space to make sure that there's uniformity yeah. so that no one's penalized, um, in particular yeah. brokers. And you saw Tommy before with his tick and flick option, which you know covers a base in the meantime, whilst we, it's not ideal, yeah. 
know, but it covers no. a base. The thing I would be saying to, to the audience today and for the next 12 months is really think about what you want to happen with remuneration and just don't think about what you want to happen. Think about the implications of what you want. Now, at the moment, Pete, there is so much noise around clawbacks and, and the way we're remunerated. Look, fundamentally, the, I love the way that we get paid. We're a unique industry. Yes, clawback supply yeah. is that ideal not. Um, I've got my views on clawback. But the people that be in Treasury, government and ASIC um, will see a change happen to the way trail is, is uh, paid to us. It'll just happen. Um, and we need to get the next best possible solution um, for our remuneration methodology because it is likely that we could be staring down the barrel of a change of trail. Now, um, trail, should it go? Absolutely not. Will it stay? I hope so. But in its current format, will it stay? Possibly not. They're all they're all good, uh, interesting points for, for debate, which we unfortunately we have time today. Um, our, our position on this is we don't want anything to change. I can turn down our research backs that, but um, there needs to be with any of these things, an open, honest and transparent discussion about what the total picture looks like or could look like um, and what that then means and how that, that could impact and implicate things. Um, and I guess that's what the 2022 review is partly about. It is actually focused on a borrower pays model and whether or not that's appropriate. So I'm kind of hoping we keep the conversation to that and it's not appropriate. It's been proven time and time again. Um, and, uh, and we move on. Hey, um, one last one. I've got to go, so I am running late. But the big conversation that's happening since, <laughs> everything happens when I'm on leave. So when I'm on leave in January, there's something blows to the shooter, yeah? So SLAs, how are you guys going with doing that? It, it's still a heated conversation today. Um, you know, I, I think it has progressed from where it was early in the year. I think it's limited to a couple or a few not necessarily the majority in options. I could be wrong with that, but it's still a hot conversation. How, because uh, to me, if a bank can turn around alone in 72 hours, whatever the number is through a branch, and it takes them three to four weeks to look at a loan from a broker, that's anti-competitive practices. And I will say that, so it's not on anybody else's head. Um, I will say that, it's anti-competitive from the banks. It should never be allowed. And I am tackling that with the treasurer, but, um, how are you guys going with managing that? Or is it not such a big issue from where you're sitting at the moment? I agree with you. It's a two tier system. There's channel conflict there. So that needs to be addressed and I'll put that on the table straight away. Um, listen, I'm, I'll play devil's advocate for just a second. We don't like it. We address it. In fact, last night, very late, I was on the telephone with a major four bank, uh, the head of distribution, um, trying to yep. get a matter of one of our brokers today. So yep. uh, we address it case by case. We address it as a group. Um, and I know my peers aren't happy about it either. However, to play devil's advocate, at the moment, just over six out of 10 deals that a broker supplies to a bank goes through to settlement. That means that they're resourcing up 10 people to look at 10 files and four aren't going ahead. Um, mm. Half of that is due to quality, Pete. And so I think, um, yeah, we can complain about SLAs and we'll continue to address it with them. I mean, when people offer these ridiculous cashbacks and then the brokers complain because their SLAs blew out, I mean, really, every broker in their mm. dog is buying deals to that lender because of these cashbacks. You cash need backs. to anticipate and expect to blow out in SLAs. But what brokers yeah. can do to help themselves in SLA blowouts is to improve the deal quality, quality at a national oh. average to increase conversion rates. Yeah, we, we, we've can. heard that same, we've heard that same feedback direct from lenders is, yep. and, and I agree, I will advocate the broker's position until I'm blue in the face and buried six feet under. Um, although my wife says she's going to burn me, but anyway, that's a different discussion. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it, it, we've got to do our part. We've got to make sure our deal quality is 100%, 100% of the time. And if it's not, we're going to get pushed back. So that is something we as an industry do need to be considerate of. But if we've got that, um, there shouldn't be these imbalance of delays coming out of the lenders. Um, Agreed. But on, that, yeah, on that note, my friend, I'd like to say thank you so much for joining us. Lovely to see you. Uh, we are doing FBAAs back face to face now, Pete. So I'm looking forward to actually seeing you very soon, physically rather than through a screen. It'll be wonderful. Well, um, well I'm going to give you a hug at your conference. It's, it's one of the best events of the year, Pete, in July. So I can't wait to get to it. There's a little plug for you. 
You're a good man. Yes, our conference is on the uh, end of July. It's face to face. We've signed the agreements. We're on, and uh, it's actually going to be huge. There's some really special stuff we're doing this year, but uh, we'll talk more on that soon. Buddy, take care. Thank you so much. I really thanks, appreciate Craig. your time and Kitty and Tom being with us today. And uh, thanks everyone for being with us. Um, next time we meet, we're going to have a fantastic conversation with one of the leading brokers in Australia, talking about how you go about lodging half a billion in loans in a year, working as a well-oiled machine to reduce your stress level and improve your mental health and uh, make your job more enjoyable. Christian Stevens is going to join us. It's going to be a great conversation. And uh, please join us for that 15th of April. And uh, we will uh, all get a, uh, some really interesting learnings from that. So thank you very much. Thanks again to our sponsors. Don't forget to get your CPDs and uh, also, uh, there's a little survey that'll come out. Make sure you respond to us, gives us some feedback, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Take care, trust you well, and I will look forward to seeing you very, very soon because I'm traveling the country. See you then. Bye for now.